Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew's Chalmers. It is so good to be with you here this morning. We're glad that you are here, and uh, we hope that you find this time of, of worship meaningful as we worship God together. Today is, uh, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing this uh, prayer shawl, and it is prayer shawl Sunday. So we're going to be doing something special during the family time, and we're going to bless uh, the prayer shawls. And some of you have bring, brought yours from home, and uh, this is a, a way that we can uh, continue that warmth. There we go. Thank you, Christian. Um, well, friends, why don't we, each one of us, we'll talk more about the prayer shawls during the, the family time, but why don't we each take a moment to quiet our hearts in the Lord's and each other's presence? Let's do that now. Friends, the 67th Psalm, it says this, God, mark us with grace and blessing. Smile, the whole country will see how you work. All the godless nations will see how you save. God, let people thank and enjoy you. Let all people thank and enjoy you. Friends, let's sing our first hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please be seated. Friends, let us take this moment to pray. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you and we give you praise. You are so good. We're grateful for this wonderful weather. We're grateful for being here, even though life can be difficult. God, we do admit that we are a broken people. Each one of us falls short of your goodness. Each one of us do things that we regret. 
And, and gracious God, we are so blessed to have a Savior that steps in to the way for us, who dies and rises again so that sin will not have the last word. So, Father, we just praise you for Jesus. We praise you for your Son. And we, we just we, we wrap ourselves in his forgiveness, Christ's mercy and grace. And we thank you that each day, because of what you have done, is a fresh start. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and us too to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, the wonderful thing about being a child of God, being a sheep following the Savior, is that that's just simply it. We get to follow our wonderful Savior. What I'm going to do now is we're going to start family time a little early. And so all the kids, if you want to come over here, and I'm going to sing, we're going to sing a song together. It's called the Sheep Song. And so there's a few uh, actions that I need your help with. So come on over here, guys. You know this song? Oh, good. It seems like you're part happy and part not happy about that, but that's okay. Come on over here, guys. Or over there, it's fine too. We're creatures of habit, right? So... All right, so I know some of us know the actions. There's just one action, and that's basically this. It's like, I, I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. All right, so that's, that's it. It's not too hard. And big, big folks, too, were able to uh, participate in that as well. So I'll just get it started, okay? So it goes, I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I don't want to be a goat, no. I don't want to be a goat, no. Because there's no hope for goats. I don't want to be a goat, no. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. And I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I don't want to be a hypocrite. Because they're not hip to it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Because I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. And I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I don't want to be a Pharisee. And I don't want to be a Pharisee. Cause they're not fair, you see. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. All right, well done. So right now I'm going to invite Jean to come forward, and, and we're going to talk more about prayer shawls and the ministry that we have here at the church called the Prayer Shawl Ministry. Okay, guys, part the C's there for Jean to come, yeah. come oh, forward. Oh, no, right? no, 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 it's okay, Sean. Oh, well, I'm going just... to stay right oh, here so I can see their faces, okay? And the first thing I'm going to say is I'm so pleased to see all of you at church today. Did you have a good week? Yeah. yeah, and was school good? Good. Okay. 
I brought a little pink bag with me. And you know what? I'm going to need a helper. And who would like to be my helper? Oh, my goodness, it's a hard choice for me to make. Shona, can, and the next time I do it, I'll ask Addie, OK? Come on, Shona. Now, what I want you to do for me, I want you to look in this bag. I'll hold it. And I want you to find out what's in there. Would you take a look? OK. Now, you may have some paper. Just throw it about. It's OK. There. We can pick it up after. Now, can you, can you be, get that out for me? Now, I want you to show it to them, OK? This is a very special one. And would you like to let them feel it? Do you know what this is? Does, does, does anyone know? OK, what is it then? A what? A quilt. Well, it's kind of close to a quilt. But if I hold it like this, and you can all feel it, feel it like that, OK? And what does that remind you of? Does it not remind you of something warm? And I'm going to show you. This is called a prayer shawl. And this is my prayer shawl. OK? And the ladies of our church, Shoni, you can sit down now. It's OK. And thank you for your help, OK? Anyways, the ladies of our church here, for a long, long time, have been knitting prayer shawls. And we send them to people who are sick. And these people just love them because why? Why would they like them? Look. What am I doing? Oh, they need to be warm, and also they're cozy. And when we send them, we get a nice bag, and we get a special card. And in our card, we put a prayer. And it's always very special, because it tells them that God loves them, and we love them and we're thinking about them. And you know God cares for you and you and you and you. Every day, wherever you are, if you're at home, or if you're at school, or if you're at play. So now I'd like to have a little prayer, and I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to, to bow your heads like this, OK? And I'm going to say a few words, and I want you just to say after me. Dear Lord, thank, okay, dear Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you for all the ladies who knit these wonderful sh shawls. They are given to people. Can you just say with me, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit of ahead of you. They just say they are given to people. They are given to people. Who are sick. Who are sick. And they need to feel. Need to feel. Your love. And your warmth. Your warmth. In Jesus' name we pray these words. Amen. These words. Amen. Okay, then. Thank you. And I think at this time, Reverend Sean, can they go to Sunday school now? Have sure. you finished with them? Definitely. Okay, off you go. And thank you, and have a great time. Great. Hey, Jeff, could you just go back there and provide some backup for the teachers for a little bit? J thanks, you're, you're a saint, I seriously. Thanks so much. Um, so yes, prayer shawls, and so all you need to do to receive one is to get sick, so don't uh, feel like you're, if you're left out, it's, it's a good thing. But this is a very important ministry, and um, we pray once a month. There's about five or six of us that get together, and we pray for you and we pray for the church, and we pray for the community. And we do actually just ask God to 
to provide his warmth and love through these prayer shawls. So, you know, however that works, we don't know, but we do know that people do receive that. So I'm just going to very quickly read this letter from a person that received it. Dear Sandra, I wanted to express my heartfelt gratitude um, I have for you for knitting the beautiful shawl that comforted me, comforted me daily. The shawl itself is, is so lovely, and the colors were my mother's favorite. I told her about it and how the love of a friend and a, and a stranger to, to have warmed our hearts. The shawl represents your kindness and care for others. It represents your hope and love. Thank you so much for your kindness, uh, Tanya and Audrey um, Kari, my mother. So that's just a nice, uh, a nice note. But, but thank you for everyone. I know Ann Phillips does it, Jean, and a number of ladies. I don't even know who. But thank you for, for, for knitting these uh, Sheila as well. Um, thank you. And Betty, Betty, Betty Wessel, of course. Yes. All right. Oh, yes. Now please, we'll stand together and sing Spirit of the Living God. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We have just a pile of announcements. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. We have a pile of announcements this morning. So I'm going to ask you to, they are printed in your bulletins, to be sure and read them uh, when you get a chance, when you get home. Not during a sermon, though. <laughs> He'll get mad at you. <laughs> um, uh, just very briefly, I'm just going to touch upon uh, the Women's Society, Women's Missionary Society are coming up in September. Evangel Hall is coming up in October. Busy, busy fall. And um, the Community Bible Study is starting at the Baptist Church. And the Alpha Sessions start here in October. That is a really brief announcement, guys. In the meantime, uh, Betty Bingham has a special announcement she wants to share with us. Good morning. To celebrate the 36 years that David Phillips has been our clerk of session at St. Andrew's Chalmers, we are going to have a small celebration of lunch after the service on Thanksgiving Sunday. We also would like to make a donation to CREEF on behalf of Dave. So John Gould and I will be collecting any of these funds that you would like to donate for that purpose. It's going towards uh, doing things for the 
for handicapped and making things more uh, easily available for everyone there. So please see us if you'd wish to contribute. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. And one important announcement that I didn't touch on was our Orange Shirt Day, which is coming up next Sunday. Um, just to remind you about it, and I think we've heard about it every week, and it's very exciting. Uh, there will be tickets for the dinner. Where's Betsy? <laughs> Um, are they in the office? In the hall. Be uh, Betsy has a table set up downstairs in the hall, and she will have tickets available there for the dinner that will be on um, the end at six over at the Anglican Church afterwards. And speaking of the Orange Shirt Day, I think Pat has an announcement. Good morning. Okay. What we are looking for is we want to be as authentic as we possibly can for Orange Shirt Day. So we're looking for some people to make bannock. Now that is the unleavened bread that the Aboriginal people took when they went from camp to camp. And of course they didn't have ovens. It went into the frying pan or over the coals and it was baked that way and it kept for a long time. There is a very simple recipe on the internet and I think, did you put it up Betsy? It's downstairs. So far we have three people who are willing to try this. You don't even have to roll it out, guys. It's knead and push, and then put it in the oven. It's not difficult. Um, to make it taste even better, we've had some volunteers who are going to bring homemade jam. And um, I look forward to hearing from anyone who would like to give this a try. Trust me, everybody knows I bake at Breeden's, and so, you can do it. Um, I'd also like to express that this day is so important. Remember we had the Kavanaugh series? This was one of our special Sundays. And also this is our mission for the church for the past year and a half. So try really hard to get here and we'd love to see you all in orange t-shirts. We know that most of them are sold out. Doesn't matter what color of orange, just wear an orange shirt, blouse, sweater, whatever, and we'll look forward to seeing you all in your bright finery next Sunday. Thank you, Pat. Um, that sort of concludes my part, but we have a very important, uh, very important information about the Presbytery visit coming up that um, I've asked Sean to share with us. Thanks, Joanne. Yes, um, October the 21st, every five years, uh, the Presbytery, all the churches, Presbyterian churches in the area, um, they visit um, each church in the area. So it's kind of our turn. I think it's almost like six or seven years. But um, so October the 21st, four people from Presbytery will come to our service. And then after the service, they'll just take any questions. And uh, so what we've done, um, they've asked us to as well, is uh, provide you with a blue questionnaire here. So we don't expect you to fill this out. But over the next three Sundays, if you're able to, you know, at your home, think hard at, about our programs, etc., fill it out, and there'll be a questionnaire box at the back of the church here. You just fold it up, you put it inside. But I think it's, it's just important that... Um, you know, we're not perfect, but we need your feedback as well. And so the Presbytery wants that so that, you know, we can make sure everything is going well together. So please take that time. It would really help um, the church, our church out. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Your first scripture reading this morning is Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 to 33. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisee. First wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? 
for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. Then you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would never have joined them in killing the prophets. But in saying that, you testify against yourselves that you were indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead and fish out your arteries, your ancestors started, stakes, sons of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of hell? The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. God save you by his grace you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is the gift from God's salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. These words contain God's wisdom and guidance for us. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Well, we had a, a really great uh, Sunday. If you missed it last week, it was our welcome service, welcome back and kickoff service. There was a baptism last Sunday. And so I just wanted to thank everybody for the role in that service, the folks that did the lunch and the choir and the Sunday school, um, the cake, everybody who, thank you, we really appreciate it. Well, today is the final message in our sermon series called Big Questions. And so we've tackled some tough questions of faith and life. Um, to help us think through what we believe. Uh, last week, I, I shared also about the inspiration for the series. It's uh, from Mark Clark. Uh, he wrote the book called The Problem of God. And so this is available in the library. And I read it this summer, and this book really impacted me. Mark lays out uh, many um, big questions in the form of problems that uh, he outlines. There's about 15 or so. And uh, so if, if, you, if this series has impacted you, I encourage you to pick up the book and, uh, and read it if you're, if you're still wondering and, and want to dig deeper. Well, thanks so much for your input for this series. Uh, it was your inspiration. I gave you eight or so questions, and these are what you came up with. The first week we did, is there any evidence for God? The second week is, can science and faith be friends? The third one was about the problem of evil and suffering. Last week we looked at, is the Bible trustworthy? Is it really reliable? And today we're going to look at the question, why are Christians hypocrites? It's a tough question, but we're going to dig a little deeper into this question today. You know, I remember hearing a quote in seminary um, that said this. It said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. It apparently traces back to one of Gandhi's associates. They don't exactly know who said it. Um, and yet, regardless, its impact is significant because it summarizes how Christians, like any other person or faith system or belief system, we say one thing and we do another. It's just the way that it is. And the Bible isn't naive to this. It strongly warns Christians to practice what you preach. It's from Matthew 24, that expression comes from, practice what you preach. And yet, uh, David Kinnaman of the Barna Group put his research together in a book called Unchristian, What a New Generation Really Thinks About Christians. 
And through interviews with different generation, David concluded that Christianity was, a, was rejected most often, not because of the teachings of Jesus or because the Bible was unreliable, but how the people that followed these things acted. So basically, he, he narrowed it down to two things. The most common results of why people don't become Christians is that their followers were judgmental, and the second was hypocritical. So these two things, it wasn't the teachings, but it was the way that people followed, followed these teachings. So critics and skeptics of Christianity and, in, and religion, um, they often blame religion because of the unloving nature of its followers. And I know it's way more complicated than blaming it on religion, because often religion is married with politics and ethnic realities. So you can't just put the blame on religion. And yet, if you think about all that's happened in the last while, 9-11, extremism, it's hard not to blame religion sometimes. And we Christians, we need to wrestle with this question, why are Christians hypocrites? Because we may turn other people off as well. Well, one of the things to be aware of biblically is that Jesus taught his disciples that not everybody is a true disciple. I mean, Jesus experienced this firsthand. He's with his, his, his buddies, the Twelve. They're at the table. And, you know, Judas is there too. And so Judas is the one who, with a kiss, he sealed Jesus' fate as the guards came to arrest Jesus. He alerted the guards to... So Jesus knew about betrayal. He knew about false disciples. And, um, you know, I think if we're, we're called to be not judgmental, but discerning of the teaching that we have. And so the way that the apostles taught, if it sort of, if the person is um, lining it up with Christ, if they're teaching Christ about his life and his death and his resurrection, that's a good marker to say, okay, let's listen to this person. But there's a lot at stake. You know, and I remember um, I talked with a friend just this week, and um, she just shared with me how um, she was asked to be a sponsor of her nephew um, in a particular denomination, and she was really upset that she didn't fit the criteria to be this sponsor. And I, I felt bad for her, sitting there with her, um, you know, that some people, she just made this comment. She said, you know, some people, um, they may fit the criteria, but I know them, they're not very good people. She made that comment, and it stuck with me. You know, you, you, you may not fit the criteria in that she wasn't allowed to be part of this, this celebration. Because we too, we can go to church on Sunday, put on our, our Sunday best, and if, if the decisions and the things that happen here don't influence our, our day-to-day, if we're not slowly changed by, by what we hear and what we participate in, um, you know, it's, it's meaningless. And yet, as I was writing the sermon, you know, I have to say that I had a few, few moments this week. I'm writing this sermon on hypocrites. And uh, I had a few moments with my family. I wasn't a very nice guy this week. And uh, that can weigh on you a little bit when you're writing a sermon on being a hypocrite. But uh, this is the reality of the walk that we have on our Christian faith. And yet, Jesus took issue with people who say one thing and do another. In Matthew, 20, in Matthew 7, he said, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but who are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, by the way that they act. You know, it's important to, for us to realize that we naturally put our best face forward. It's important to, to know that sometimes we can just, someone passes by, how are you doing? And we just say, yep, just fine, everything's great. And deep down we know that it's tough. And so it's okay to, um, to seek out people that we can trust and share what's going on in our lives. Because each one of us do go through difficulty. This is that passage that John read that said, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, Full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisee. First wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. You know, this is, this is one of the things I think that turns people off the most, that we can get so fixated on making ourselves outside look well, when inside we know it's a different story. You know, I think people are turned off Christianity too because of terrible things that have been done in the past. 
There's a connection with Christianity, and, and, and it's good for us as Christians to say, yes, things have happened in the past. People are flawed, um, have been marred by hurt and even bloodshed. People who claim to follow Christ did things that actually were contrary to Christian teaching. It's important to, to, admit, to admit this, and with Orange Shirt Day, we're, we're trying to walk that line of reconciliation. But the Crusades in history are another example. There is a lot of misinformation about the Crusades. People say that it was a, a war over religion. And yet, um, Rodney Stark, he's a historian at the Baylor University, he contends the opposite. He says the Crusades were over land and about protecting land opposed to converting one another, Muslims trying to convert Christians and Christians trying to convert um, Muslims. It was about land. Sound familiar today? Clark too points out that this political and nationalistic agenda was about expanding worldly kingdoms. This is the way that it is. And they used religion as a guise to do so. This sounds familiar as well. You know, the things done with association to the name of Christ, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the death toll, it's horrible. Hundreds of thousands, we have to be honest. And yet at the same time, some people fixated on critiquing Christianity will throw the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, I remember there was a time in my life when I was part of a, a group, a young adult, and I was going to this church, and as, as I got close to the leadership, I just started to see the leadership with faults, pride, and arrogance. And I was kind of like, this isn't for me. I didn't really sign up for this, right? And I was tempted to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, I knew the teachings were legit. This was, it was touching my heart. Yet, I was with these people that were in leadership, and then I started to think, you know what? Like, I don't know if I can do this. Throwing, tempted to throw the baby out with the bath, bath water. And yet the point of all this is that, that there is blood in every system of belief, whether you're Muslim or Hindu or atheist, you have a faith system, you believe that God doesn't exist. There's blood on all of our hands. None of us have clean hands. And yet people often criticize the church for being hypocrites because they simply don't understand the core of its teaching, like I did with those, those leaders at that church. You know, I assume that being the Christian is being the same as being good. But that's the farthest from the truth. The gospel message is about what Christ does for you. You're not good, and you need to be saved. I need to be saved. And that's the point of the message. We're not good, but Christ is. He did it for us. So we can wake up each new day and say, God, I'm a screw-up. But thank thankfully that you didn't screw up. You lived life to the fullest. You showed us how to live life as a true human being. The Apostle Paul, he put it this way. He said, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. And salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Jesus had to suffer and be crucified and die and be raised again because of this problem of sin in the world. And because we can't fix it, he had to do it. And I think where we lose sight of things is when we divorce this core teaching from the church about grace and the togetherness of the community in the grace of God. Because we're all on a journey together, coming at it from different perspectives, different skills, different gifts and backgrounds. And we, when we forget that the church is a hospital for sinners, and not a club for saints. That's what we're going to screw it up. It's a hospital for sinners. That's the church. It's a hospital for sinners. And the church ought to be the safest place in the world to bring our hurts and our struggles and our hardships and to find people that are going through their struggles as well. People who admit that they too are sinners but are saved by God's amazing grace. You know, personally, um, my dad is a fantastic man. I'm biased, of course, but he's a good Christian man. I can say that. And, um, you know, I've observed his life change a lot from my teen years to where he is today. But, um, you know, he's, he's a fantastic Christian man. And yet, you know how Christians put the, uh, the little fish on the back of their car? You know, have you seen that little fish? And that's just a sign that they're a Christian. My dad 
great guy, Christian man, could never put a sign, a little fish sign on the back of his car. No way he could ever do that. He is the most scariest driver ever. I'm in the front seat, and I'll tell, like, I could phone him today and, and say, Dad, you know, you're a scary driver. I will do that. I'm not talking bad about him. But I'm in the front seat. My mom's in there, and we are banging on the brake. Like, so I can't. I'm, I'm the calmest guy driving with anybody else, but he scares me. And yet, we are on a restoration project. God is still redeeming us. We can be a Christian, and God is still working on us. It's, it's sanctification, this idea that we're being transformed into the image of God. But it doesn't happen overnight. It's a long process, and God keeps working on each of us because we're broken people. But God is at work. Paul actually calls us God's masterpiece because he loved us and created us uniquely for specific reasons. Yes, our lives are marred with sin, but in Christ, we are made new. We're not the same person we were 10 years ago, and five years ago, and two years ago, and a month ago. Christ has created us anew, and each day is a new day to focus on the grace of God and to move forward with our lives. People may, people may see us as hypocrites, and I remember, and they may, they may say, you know, I remember when you used to live like that. But that is not today. Today is a new day in Christ. Christ sees us differently. Christ knows our hearts. Christ is willing to stand up for us when it matters the most. Christ is at work bringing good things out from our lives. Look, I understand that living in this postmodern society when nothing, it's all shifting sand, nothing is secure, nothing is solid anymore, it's shifting. We can't, it's, it's so hard to know what is true and what is good anymore. Power being deconstructed, you know, political leaders with power, and you're like, huh? This doesn't make any sense. And yet the foundation of the Christian faith is Jesus, not the people who try to follow him. Did you get that? The foundation is Christ. The, pe the people that follow him will let you down. Absolutely 100%. So if you still believe that the church is filled with hypocrites, I would have to agree with you. You are right on. Yet the church is filled with hypocrites. It doesn't mean that the Christian faith isn't valid. It doesn't mean that the Christian faith is somehow isn't true or isn't working. The fact that there's hypocrites, it points to the fact that it is working. Christ came to save sinners. And Christ is doing his work in the church with a bunch of hypocrites. That is why in your homes, you need to love your wife and your husband, your kids and your grandkids. You need to have grace with them. Our Lord loves us enough that he's willing to die for us. And we need to do that for our loved ones and for those in our community. Because all of us are here, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. And the weight of sin is when it's strongest, we need to go towards Christ. That's when we need to go the most. So what you and I can do is continue to trust this Savior. Because we're not perfect. We haven't arrived. But we have an incredible Savior who has. See, this doesn't excuse hypocrisy. We don't have a free pass that says, you know, we can do whatever we want. You know, uh, Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. We don't have that. No. But we do have a Savior who has called us to be a new creation. And each day we are on that path, turning away from what's wrong and doing what's right, because we have a Savior who's given it all for us. So friends, what if we judge the truth of the faith not by flawed individuals who will let you down, but by the life and death of the one who won't? What if instead of being let down by those attempting to follow him, we were encouraged by the confidence that we have in Christ, who promises us new life? Friends, imitate Christ. You will not be let down. Amen. Our next song is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
stand. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this community. We thank you for friendship with our neighbors and for family and friends. God, we have so much to be grateful for. Your grace um, so evident in our lives. And yet, God, we do acknowledge um, that we live in a broken world with broken relationships and a broken creation, tsunamis and earthquakes and, and the whole lot of it, God. It's, it's a bit of a mess at times. And yet, God, you have, um, you know, in your, in your wisdom, you are bringing this earth to a good place. You are bringing our lives to a good place. And, and although we wait this moment when everything is made right, 
and the earth is renewed, our bodies are renewed, we are restored to family and friendships and, and life forevermore, this new creation. God, help us to be your agents of justice and peace, mercy and hope and love and grace in this world. Help us to be your people. God, we do pray for those who are going through difficulties today, families that are going through um, sickness and health problems. We pray for those who are going through treatments and uh, those who are just, their bodies aren't working like they used to. We thank you that you do walk with us and promise us new creation. And God, help us as we are on this path. Father, thank you for the church, your flawed body, and yet in you it's made right. It's made perfect. God, help us to witness to this world in the way that you've called us to, being your people. We thank you for your wisdom that you give to us. We thank you for each person here and how you walk with them and promise to. And we ask, O oh God, that by your spirit you would renew us today so that tomorrow we're different. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our next song is, um, actually, if the ushers could come forward now for the offering.
Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for these gifts. We know that uh, your grace is abundant. Lord, help us to use these gifts uh, to get this message out in this community, to, to build up this community in your name. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, our final hymn of the morning is number 485. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Actually fits in with the uh, sheep song, too, so that's kind of nice. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen.